Here we go. We're officially recording. And so everyone has a record of me recording it. So if it messes up, because last week when actually I um, stored it, it like stored two separate recordings, one of like the camera and then one of the screen. And I didn't think you wanted me kind of dancing around here. So I had to kind of find the other recording of this actual screen itself doing that. So the first time I posted it. So it's kind of this WebEx is a little bit odd, a little bit weird. Um, but today we're going to talk about week, week number two. We're going to open up some Excel. See how familiar some, some people are with I think it was Take it as an undergrad. So all you have to do is uh, let me look at uh, what you did. And if you took it, if you just did the undergrad, all you got to do is the paper. Okay. Everything else is the same. You don't have to do the paper. So week number two, uh, we're going to talk about descriptive statistics. Like we're doing the same, literally the same stuff we already did. Um, and the paper stuff, uh, I'm just talking to Jordan here, but the paper stuff is sitting right here. Uh, position paper rubric, you know, November 20th. So. so did you do a paper when you took it as an under? Only thing you need to do, literally. Uh, that's above and be uh, above and beyond uh, what we're doing here. So I'm pretty sure you did all the readings. Like you got like an A plus 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 <laughs> in this class because undergraduates basically you only have to do two readings, and so you could do you know all four of them and earn extra credit. And all the grad students need to take you know they need to do all all four of the readings for. Uh, full credit here. And so week number two, we're going to talk about descriptive statistics, mean, median, mode, and all that other good stuff. Uh, we're going to look at an exercise. We're going to look at a couple of in-class exercises. We're looking at some data from the uh, North Carolina Department of Public Schools. We're going to look at reportable crime rates, kind of get into the idea of what we call normalization. And then we're actually going to kind of get look at some of the downloadable data from the North Carolina Violent Death Reporting System. So this is kind of interesting here because when we look at the Violent Death Reporting System here, you look at the number of rows here, and I've opened it up in Excel, and I'm at row like 420,926. Who wants to look at a big Excel spreadsheet with that many rows? No, but we all do online when we say, I want to look at by race for this county, percent violent, day, violent death for this particular year. So we can really drill nice and deep into these different data. In addition, I'll kind of mention a couple things about the use and application of geostatistics where people say, you know, what, you know, especially me, what are some of the things that we can do with this stuff here? And I saw something interesting here called an environmental data manager. You know, you can imagine what that person does here. But, you know, we have an understanding of geostatistics, a little of analytical chemistry uh, plus, but this is a person who analyzes environmental data because what are examples of environmental data that you deal with every day? Climate, weather, air quality, water quality, every, everything else out there. Now, what are you going to do to that data? You're just going to collect it and let someone else figure it out? Or are you going to be the person who figures it out? What do, you, what do you think the pay rate for the people who figures it out versus the data people are? It's a little bit higher here. And I, I thought I saw the, so I thought I saw the pay for this one up here. It was like 70, 80, you know, 70 to $80,000 a year. But this environmental data manager who goes and fosters and uses these data, you know, uh, one of the things that I'm kind of thinking of off the top of my head is EPA. Uh, it, you can download these days. You can go to the EPA and download EPA data on a daily basis. It's really interesting. And so I can kind of click on the pollutant here and I'll let other people kind of let me know what this is. But. PM 2.5, PM 10. What's this PM stuff stand for? 
Articulate. Articulate. What's the difference between 2.5 and 10? The size, so like 2.5 inches. What, what kind of units are we looking at here? Nanometer, okay. We got SO2, what's that stuff stand for? Sulfur dioxide? Is that good or bad? I assume all this stuff's bad, right? Let me see. Uh, PB, what's that? Lead, uh, carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, ozone, you know, the stuff that's supposed to be way up in the atmosphere. But I can click PM10, I can click the year 2023, I can click North Carolina. I can just, you know what? I'm just going to pick every single site right here. I'll just pick North Carolina and let me get the data. Okay. And so now we're, we're looking at EPA data for all of North Carolina. Now let's see what it gives me. Oh, here it is. Cool. So uh, it lived up, lived up to it here. Site. Okay, cool. What are we going to do with it? Daily AQI value, what's that stand for? Air quality index or something like that? Like that. What does AQI go up to? What's that? I don't know, I'm asking. This is out of my skill set. I, maybe 20, someone said 20, so I, I don't see... I, I don't see anything that goes above 20, so it might be 20. Is 20 a good or 20 a bad? Bad? Okay. Well, it kind of looks like that. But now when we look at this here, we've got, I don't know, 180 things right here for North Carolina. We've got, you know, it looks like we just got it for one county right here. So about 180 of these. We've got daily PM, AQI, site. Uh, is there any way that I can map this? I got a latitude, I got a longitude. Can we make a map out of it? Of course we can. Now, if we're mapping this right here, if I'm only mapping one thing, am I really like mapping it? Am I really doing geography or GIS? Not really, because it's only one thing. You know, I, w I want a number of different things out there. But some of the, the, the critical columns that we're looking at here, I think this AQI is pretty interesting, but we look at the daily mean of PM10 concentration. What are some things that we can do on this? We can map rolling averages, averages, five-day averages, three-day averages, to look at the trends right there. Because you can see, you know, we've got 16, 11, 9, 6, 7, 6, 11, 14, where it's going to go down and up. And so we can also map it not only with AQI, but with other indicators like temperature, air pressure, all the other things that help dictate air, AQI as well as PM. What are some of the determinants of PM10? What determines how much PM10 is in the atmosphere? I'm kind of leaning on our environmental science folks here. I'm uh, looking at Kaya there. Let's see. Your environmental science person here. So what what's the what kind of what determines it? I don't know either. So you're gonna let me know. Like dust. dust um what? Construction. Yeah, storms, tornadoes, agriculture, everything, but probably car exhaust or whatever else is out there. And so we've got all this data kind of sitting there, and our fundamental questions are, and what we're going to talk about today here a little bit is, what are we going to do with it all? I might click on all sites here. Now we can. Get all these data and, and start to kind of make some sense of these. Now I don't download them for all sites instead of just the very first site. 
look how many columns we have there. So I've got some individual latitudes and longitudes. I'm going to be asking some people some really tough questions here. What if I wanted to, people who've taken GIS before, what if I wanted to find the average for each of the sites and map those? What would some, be some things that I can do? Because now I've downloaded all the AQI on a daily basis for all of these different sites right here. And now I've got about 2,000 individual records with probably, I don't know, a dozen or so different locations throughout the state. Now I can make some maps of AQI. What are some things that I can do? How can I group this? What's that thing we were talking about last class a little bit? When I did that, when I mapped the average age of each decedent by county in that spatial join, what was I really running? Anyone remember that function I really like in GIS? It's called a summary. Remember that summary? What's that do? Counts the number of times something appears. That's what you did with a join count, right? Count the number of times so that in Durham is 2397. Something else that was whatever else. And so when we open up exercise number two, all we did was a summary. And then while we're at it, hey, let's average up all the ages of deaths while we're here. Well, why don't we find the min, find the max, everything else? And so these are some things that we can talk about. So what we're going to talk about today are what we call descriptive statistics. And then we're going to open up a couple of data sets so that we can kind of explore those. And so visualizing data dist distributions here. So we have all this tabular data. We've looked at three examples. We looked at just violent, violence by school, district or whatever. We've got air quality by different site where we can maybe run a Summary on it, how do we select the cohort data? High availability, low availability. High COVID, low COVID. Robeson versus this county, urban block groups. Some of these are gonna be spatial in nature. Some of these will be non-spatial in nature. So I can go, I've got an Excel spreadsheet. We call this an attribute table. So when you right mouse click, you can open up that attribute table that goes back and forth between the map the dialogue, map in the dialogue. So we have this one-to-one -one relationship between the number of records here in ArcGIS Pro as opposed to the number of features that exist on this map here. In this case, maybe we're looking at block groups or whatever. So we can look at these. I could map, you know, the average percent minority for this group versus this group to see if there's any difference. So I can say, hey, low-income areas have worse access to healthy food compared to high-income areas or compared to non-low-income areas. And we talk about the definitions of those. What's the definition of low-income? What is farming? These are all the things we kind of stipulate. And when we get into week 13 and 14, we can kind of define or, you know, kind of tease out. Because we're going to talk about descriptive metrics. Relatively easy. Mean, median, mode, standard deviation, all in one class today. We've got scenarios for descriptive metrics. And these are what we call global metrics, meaning they describe an entire data set. So I talk about my football team. What's the number of wins for my football team? What's the average number of wins? You know, they won seven games. What's the average over the last three years, over the last five years? And so... We're going to talk about these global statistics, which are just going to be one number, as opposed to local statistics. When I say, all right, is this zip code here in a hot spot? Yes or no versus this zip code versus this zip code versus this zip code versus this zip code that we can make a map out of. And so today, it's not a lot of GIS, but we're able to create histograms or on averages using our ArcGIS Pro software. So examples are, What's the, what's my GPA? It's a descriptive statistics. It's weighted. Do you just average up A, A, B, A, and figure out what your GPA is? Why not? Okay. If you have a four credit class, is that one credit class going to count as much as the four credit class? No. So you got to weight it by what? Number of credits you take. How many wins did my favorite football team win? over my rival over the last 10 years. 
with the average COVID-19 rate by zip code? How does it compare to other states or other zip codes? What percent of people live in food deserts and urban versus rural? And so we can really start to create some hypotheses and make some statements like we do with our position paper. So those people taking this class is for graduate credit, whether you're undergrad or grad or kind of adding on, adding on to what we took previously, we make these statements and make some authoritative or concrete statements about things that you can prove or disprove. And in this class, if you're not able to prove it, that's okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. What people try to fit kind of round pegs into square holes or vice versa, I don't want to worry about that. Where we say, hey, areas in low-income areas had higher COVID rates than high-income areas. Maybe you'll find the exact opposite. That's fine. Okay. And in some of our papers that we'll look at, they, they do work that way. We've got a couple measures of what we call central tendency, meaning what's the average? Now, average can be really, really skewed. So we have something called the mo, uh, the mode. I list the score is the one that occurs the most. And it can be used with all types of data, like nominal ordinal ratio data. Do you remember those types of data? Those of you who've taken my class should. Okay. What's an example of nominal data? Age, no, not necessarily. Zip code. If my zip code is 27358 and I've got another zip code that's 27455, is 2745 better or worse? I don't know. It's just the name of it. I mean, kind of like your 820 number. I can't add and subtract your 820 number and get anything useful just like we can with zip codes. Now, within that zip code, we might have a COVID rate for my zip code versus another zip code. And I can say it's higher or lower. Or it's twice as much or three times as much where we can elicit the idea of ratios, three times as much, two times as much. But what would be an example of interval data? Does anyone remember interval data? What would be interval data? Temperature. Okay, temperature. If I had a certain temperature, if it's 40 degrees out today and it's, you know, degrees out tomorrow, I can't say it's twice as warm because, well, we can go below zero. Once we get to zero degrees Fahrenheit, what's below that? Negative one, negative two, negative three, all the way down to negative 473 or whatever it goes down to, where that COVID rates have a stopping point, zero. I can't say the COVID rate was negative seven. Yeah, because we, we can't have negative COVID cases or whatever our metric's gonna be. And so there's kind of slight differences between ratio and interval data, just the way that we can express those. And so interval data can go below zero where that ratio data can't necessarily go below zero. We have something called a median and we're gonna go and calculate these after the break. So we're gonna open up an Excel spreadsheet of um, violent acts by school district and we're gonna kind of run some statistics on those. So we have something called the median. Median is the middle. So it's just literally in the middle. Okay, it's the middle number. It's also known as the 50th percentile. You heard those percent that were percentile before? What's the highest percentile you can go to? It can't be the 105th percentile or anything like that. Whether we're looking at GPAs or what you finished in a race or whatever. And we also have something called the mean. We know the mean a lot. And this is also called the average. It's the sum of the values divided by the total number of values. So if I were to find the average exam, you know, average for the class, the median and the mean might be slightly different. And we'll talk about the use and application of these descriptive metrics um, and when we might want to use them. Now, I throw a bunch of formulas in here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, and you'll see for the book, I posted the chapter from the book today where it talks about these. I post this uh, Fundamentals of Statistics. So I scanned it in, kind of put it in there, just the sections that I want, as well as the History Guide to GIS Analysis. This is probably one of my favorite books. Okay, and this is about 15-year-old book where it really explains the different types of geostatistics that we talk about, and it's software agnostic, which means it's it's not specific to any software package. So I, I really, this is kind of one of my favorite books. I can probably read this a lot and kind of learn some new things about it every day. 
And so we'll talk about the reading a little bit, but, we, but the reading's not required. But in the book, you'll see some of these formulas right here. And the main thing that I do want us to realize is that this little X bar thing, whenever we see that, that stands for the mean, okay? The mean of everything, okay? So we average it out. This is, and then anyone remember this notation right here? This is called sigma. Then remember this from math class. I don't like it because it means like add everything up and divide by N. But this is the formula. You add it all up and you divide by N. N is your sample size. So a couple of terms that we're talking about here is N is your sample size. What sample size mean? If there's 23 people in this class, your sample size is going to be 23. And sample size is going to be really important when we start to look at tests of significance, okay, and look at margins of error. So unfortunately, we have an election coming up next year, so we're going to hear about, you know, they like this candidate, you know, 37% plus or minus 5%. Maybe only 32, maybe only 42, who knows? And that's based on the sample size. I use the example of finding the average height of everyone. They're just going to take, you know, my height, two people's height. Is that a good representation of the entire campus? Probably not. What if we went and averaged everyone's height on campus? Is that a good representation? Yeah, but it's paying that to go at, you know. And so there's a happy medium between sample size and your margin of error that you want. What's an acceptable margin of error? And so one of the things we have here is X bar. This just stands for the mean or the average, and n is equal to sample size. And we're going to refer back to these. I just want to write these down here. And those of you who can see them here, and I've kind of, I've just written them down here for those of us kind of joining them right there, and I'll kind of refer to that. So the one thing about a mean is that it's sensitive to extreme values. Because a lot of times, if you're taking class like old regional geography or intro to geography, what are some of the things going on? Like Saudi Arabia is one of the richest countries in the world, right? We hear that. There was a World Cup last year. It's one of the richest countries in the world. Meaning, like, you have someone who makes 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10 million. What's that do to the average? What's it up? You know, so when they say, you know, the average income in this country is, you know, $60,000, well, that's pretty cool, but what's the median income in those countries? A lot lower. And so the thing about the mean is that it's susceptible to outliers where that the median is not. Um, so the median is another popular measure. Um, it's resistant to extreme values, meaning it's the middle. Now, how do you calculate the middle? Okay, I have five values. What's the middle one? One, two. I'm not going to do the thing, but you know what I mean. It's the, the, the middle one, the third one, right? That's pretty easy to calculate. But now I have six values. What's the middle one? It's like three and a half. So basically, the median is the average of the two middle if you have an even number, but it's the middle if you have an odd number. Remember, we talked about this in raster class a little bit. If we have a 5 by 5 matrix, there's a middle to the 5 by 5. And so we have these moving windows with neighborhoods because it's got a middle. But what's the middle of a 4 by 4? No middle. No, there's no middle or focus or whatever there. And in addition, when we have odd numbers, we're working with what? You know, 3 by 3 is going to be an odd. 5 by 5 is going to be odd. So you have kind of better differences and more granularity when it comes to like majorities and things like that, where you're not going to have that case as well. So the good thing about it is it's resistant to extreme values. It's not as mathematically crack, um, tractable. So you have to sort the data first and then kind of figure out which one the middle is. Now it's pretty easy to do. If I have 10, well, it's just going to be five and six, the average of five and six. Now, when we visualize this distribution, it's a graphical representation of numerical data. And so we've got this thing here called a histogram. Typically, when we work with normalized data, who remembers that term normalized data? I'm kind of peeking back there. Who's going to make eye contact? Oh, Alondra's going to make eye contact with me. 
Um, I'm just kidding. But what is this idea of normalized data? We've got Nyanda here. Maybe we'll keep her honest here. Who remembers what uh, normalized data is? Did you work with, when you did the number of cancer deaths by county, is that normalized data or non-normalized data? Which county had the most cancer deaths? How about that little table that you filled out? Who had the most? Mecklenburg, who was second? Wade, third, Guilford. What's that list kind of sound like? Population. And so things are skewed, phenomena are skewed by population. Basically, it's, it's not normalized. Now, those of you, when we were, I think I was showing a, a, a Alondra, there's a little button there in ArcGIS Pro, and we'll get to it. Those of you getting new to it is that you can click a little button and normalize by population. Now we can figure out the rates of cancer. Now, so there's some other things going on with cancer that we'll talk about later that we need to deal with. When we look at normalized data that are high in the middle, low on the end, this is what we look at right here. And we can make these really quickly, export these to a table, and then pop these into charts and graphs. To me, much easier than you could do in R or Excel or any of these things here. Just do them in ArcGIS Pro. And since we're working with spatial data, that also brings in standalone tables. Chapter seven or whatever, we can bring in tables here. These are relatively easy to make. But this shows a distribution of the data. And so on one axis is gonna be the value. Another axis, typically the Y axis, is gonna be your frequency. And we see these all the time. But we see some symmetric, we see skewed right, skewed left, bimodal, multimodal, meaning it goes down and up, okay? We have symmetric, asymmetric. We've got tons of different things here. But me, I like looking at this normal distribution curve right here where it's high in the middle, low on the left and right. What are some phenomena that are going to be normalized that you see on an everyday basis? What are some phenomena you see on an everyday basis here? What about the number of wins, you know, football season? You know, what's, you know... How many teams are going to win 15 games a year? Maybe one. How many teams are going to win zero games a year or one game a year? Maybe one. How many teams are going to win eight or nine games a year? Ah, huh, you know, probably four or five or six. So it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Now they get this 17 game season or whatever. It's kind of messed it up a little bit. So depending upon the nature is going to be the dist distribution of the data. So we can look at something like median household income. And so if we have the word like average or median, guess what? It's already normalized. So we can look at median household income right here. We can see it's kind of high in the middle, low on the sides here. And in this case, the mean and the median for this particular area are about the same. We can look at median household income. But we can make these in ArcGIS Pro. And in ArcGIS Pro, we can look at the median age of every county in North Carolina. There are counties that go up to 49.5, where half the people are over the age of 49.5, half the people are under the age of 49.5. There's another county, Onslow County, where half the people are over the age of 25.9, the other half are under the age of 25.9. This is a really young county. Why is the Onslow County such a young county, meaning it has so many young people there? What's the significance of Onslow County? which is kind of like sitting right down here. Exactly. It's got Camp Lejeune right there. So Marines and their families here. And then, but we can see the normal distribution right here. And in ArcGIS Pro, I've got the mean, I've got the median, I've got the standard deviation, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and it puts the count. So I've got that sample size right there. Min, max, sum, nulls. We'll talk about the word range. I won't mention these things like skewness and kurtosis, which tells how we kind of flatten these things up. We'll leave those for another statistics class, and I'm not necessarily an expert at those. But what I can do is I can check something. So I've got a little graph right here that I can pop out, right mouse click, save. These days, 
With ArcGIS Pro, you click on that share button, I saw a couple of people playing with it, and you can export that map to a clipboard. You don't even have to do screen capture, do a little grabby thing and copy it over, and it'll probably degrade the quality. You can screen capture that map onto your clipboard, stick it into a Word document, stick it into a PowerPoint, stick it wherever you want to, and have it as a powerful visual way to go. Me personally, I like exporting those to high quality TIFFs because TIFFs are kind of what journals and books and all those other things are going to want to use at some point in time. And they take up a lot more space, but for anything you'll do in this class that you can insert into a Word document, I'm more than happy with those. But you can see examples of you know, normal distribution. Does anyone play Wordle? I used to. I got in a habit of it here. You do? And then you get a little graph at the end, and you can see, look at my, you know, look what I did there. You know, cool. And so you can see examples of normal distributions. Uh, this is what I did here with the NFL Combine. So I went to the NFL Combine page, and I exported out all of the quarter meter dashes, vertical jumps, bench press, broad jump, shuttle runs, all those other things. Because we can export these things out. I can just do save as, copy these things right into an Excel spreadsheet. And there's also something called web scraping, where it says, hey, I love this table. And on the web page, let me just export this thing out right into a web page. But I can look at the 40 yard time for all the people sitting in the NFL combine for this particular. So all the way from 4.27, all the way up to 5.62. No, so you, you think of, you know, this is the you know, NFL combine, just sticking this data right here and looking at the frequency. Look at the number right here. We're looking at a couple of hundred different people here who you know, participated in the 2020 combine or whatever it was. Here, like I showed before, here's the number of wins in 19, from 2019 to 2020 in the NFL season before they went to the 17-game schedule. I think, is this the second year or third year of the NFL 17? I forget. Okay, but you can see not a lot of teams win in 15 or 16. Not a lot of teams win in, you know, one, two, three, four. Most of these teams are going to be at seven, eight, nine. <clears throat> now, the other thing we have is a weighted mean. You all know what a weighted mean is because you've all calculated your GPA at one point in time. Where that, that A that you earn in health class, one credit health class, isn't going to count as much as the four credit biology lab that you didn't earn an A. In. And so it's not going to, you're just not going to average up the A and the B and, you know, it even up. So it's similar to the arithmetic mean, but each of the data points contributing equally to the final average, some data points contribute more than others. And so a quick little calculation, when we look at the mean, it's going to be like X1 plus X2 plus X3 all over N, where that this one is going to be X1 times sum, eight one plus X2 times sum, eight two plus X3 times some weight rate all over under all over N. And in theory, the weights should all add up to 100 or add up to 1. Okay. Kind of like your quality hours, right? What do you divide by? At the end of the day, when you go and add up all your GPA and all that other stuff, what do you divide by? The number of credits. And then what do the, each of the weights add up to be? All right, a four plus two plus a one plus four plus three should add up to the total number of credits. So eventually, you're still divided by one, but you're just, each of these numbers aren't quite counting the same as they would for an average versus a weighted mean. And so when you calculate your weighted average, you're, you're still, it's still adding up to the same thing, but your weights, and they call them quality points or something like that, isn't quality points the number of credits times your grade? And so this weight one times X1 grade times credits, it's called quality points plus quality points plus quality points, all divided by your number of credits gives you that weighted average right there, where we get that from. And so I think that's a really good example of kind of weighted average, but 
Now we're going to do something with weighted average here using aspatial data, and then we'll do something a little different. So enumeration units with higher populations will contribute more to a weighted area than data points with less. So now I look at median household income. I look at population. When I look at this here, median household income here, these weight more than these because there's less people that live here. There's less people contributing this $40,000 and this $45,000 than these people contributing their $39,000. Now, remember, we're still just working with spatial data here. So there will be a difference if I go and average all these up, average all these up versus taking a weighted average of these. So this weighted average is going to be a little different. It's going to be 2814 or 15% times 2814 divided by the sum of all that, right? That sum of all that is what? The total number of credits that you're taking that. And so we've got some formulas for these. What we're going to do for these, we're going to calculate these in Excel. And hopefully they make sense. You know, and so when we calculate these, these should be somewhere near the average. If you get really wacky values, then guess what? You, you did it wrong, and we can revisit these versus this. And so we got another formula right here. I, you know, like I said before, I don't necessarily like this symbol right here because all we're doing is just this symbol stands for sigma notation, which means we're just going to count up to n, count your total number of sample sizes. But what we're going to do is just the, at the value times the weight divided by the sum of the weights. Okay. Now, with your GPA, your sum of your weights is just the total number of credits you take. And so the number of credits for the class times your grade. Do that as many classes as you got. Maybe you got two classes, maybe you got five classes. Do as many you know, classes as you want, and divide by that n. And so I could go and calculate these. So what we're going to do in class, you know, after the break is we're going to go, you know, calculate some weighted averages and look at all these things here. But what I'm doing right there is D2. Now what we're looking at here is Excel. How many people have used Excel before? Hopefully everyone. Probably within the next half hour, you'll all be using Excel, okay? But we're going to open it up and kind of realize some of the capabilities of it because these capabilities are really manifold. I mean, you can do programs in this thing. We can do qualitative analysis. We can look at string operations as well as calculations because what we're looking at here is I got a pop 2013. I got a median age. I got a median household income, and I can go and calculate all these here. I can really literally type in a formula and calculate the mean, the median, the standard deviation, the variance. You know, the weighted average gets a little bit difficult because it starts asking, well, what do you want me to weight it by? But the weighted average is going to be this number times this divided by the sum of all this stuff here. So if the total population is 17,000, well, this 9,000 isn't going to contribute as much to the average as this 2,000. How much less is it going to contribute? Really, like, you know, 44% less because that's 926 divided by 2186. And so that weighted average, basically, you're calculating a GPA, but with this year. And then later, what we're going to do is we're going to throw in latitude and longitude over here so we can calculate the middle of stuff and the middle of people and everything else. And so now we've got the Weighted average is 97,984 versus the mean. So why is the weighted mean now less than the mean here? Do you want to explain why the weighted mean is going to be less than the mean? Weighted mean is less than the mean for this income. I see this one here, this 1477. That's pretty high. It's going to bring it down significantly. I got a 957, that's 72,000. It's going to bring it up if it were the average, but it's not going to contribute as much to the weighted average. And so when we see that the weighted mean is less than the mean, we know that there's going to be more populous numbers below the mean as opposed to above the mean. Now, do I want to go do this math where I'm using 17,664 17, as a denominator? No, because most of the time, what do we use as a denominator? 
nine credits, 12 credits, 15 credits, 16 credits. And how many classes have we taken? Two, three, four, five. Where that here, we're taking, you know, 13 classes, literally. You know, if we look at it that way. And the same thing with this here. We also have something called dispersion. How much does the data vary? You know, what are the average number of wins for a football team? It might be really competitive where the worst team only has four wins and the best team has 12. So that's what we call a range. The difference between the min and the max. Where that one year there might be 16 teams and there might be a team that didn't win any. So that range is going to be 16. We have the min. The max, these are all things that we can do by sorting, or there's going to be nice Excel calculations that allow us to do that. And so we've got great calculations that we can do min, max, range, everything else. Now, the one thing about a range is that it's represented by one number, because a lot of times people will put like, what's the range? We'll put like 15-73. So is that 15 minus 73? No. And it's always going to be the absolute value. Now, remember from math class, what's this word absolute value mean? Absolute value. What does it mean? What's that? No negatives. It's always going to be a positive number. It's, it's always going to be, a, yeah, it's a, it represents a distance, baby, uh, basically. So it's going to represent a distance. And so it's always, though, know, it could be 15 minus 73, 73 minus 15. It doesn't matter just because you're taking the absolute value and making it a positive. And so the range is always going to be a positive number. So if you want to do highest minus lowest, lowest minus highest, it's going to be the same thing when we, you know, talk about the distance. Now we have something called the mean deviation and then the standard deviation. Who's heard the term standard deviation before? This other stuff here, I don't want to say we don't care about, but the standard deviation means how far do you vary from the mean? How far does the value vary from the mean? Now, when we actually look at the average, this is how we calculate those, where we have a value, the difference from the mean, the absolute value, we square, we add all this stuff up, and then we take the square root of this thing here. But guess what? Excel goes and does this for us. And so sometimes you'll hear the two word variation. Most of the time you'll hear the word standard deviation. So if my favorite football team wins, Six, seven, eight, two, you know, six, seven, eight, seven, seven, eight. You know, their average is going to be around seven or eight. And they'll have a very low standard deviation. But if you have another football team that wins two and then wins 15 and then wins three and then wins 13 and then wins 13 and wins two, what's their average going to be? It's going to be somewhere around seven or eight, but what's going to happen to their standard deviation? It's going to be really, really high. So if we look at countries like Saudi Arabia or Qatar, where we look at the average household and you know average household or average you know whatever income, it's going to have really high standard deviations as opposed to your kind of traditionally HDI high development index countries that you might see in world regional info geography. What's the most developed country right now? Norway or Sweden or Iceland? I don't know what. You know, but when we look at the average incomes for all those, they're all going to be relatively high as opposed to a bunch of lows and then a high and skews the average up, but to keep that standard deviation. And so standard deviation is a good measure of variation within a data set. You know, is it really high? Is it really low? You know, because two values can have the same average, but different standard deviations. You know, just think about examples like football or baseball where teams win, go up and down and up and down and, you know, you know, up and down. And so we can look at some data here where I've got spending on fruits and vegetables. And this is kind of some real world GIS data that we did in some of our analysis right here. But now I can, got, I can look at the mean, median, standard deviation. And now I can look at the variation. Uh, the variance, and then the standard deviation. So how far it deviates from the mean. How far it deviates from the mean. And these are probably, these are some things, if you've taken an intro to statistics, has anyone 
I think Barbara, you took intro to statistics, right? Does this standard deviation kind of ring a bell a little bit? Starting to. It's been a while. Okay, good answer. Good answer. That's okay. Um, but how far it deviates, because we can do calculations, because at the end of the day, we can do some analysis that says, you know, I want to build a house where what, uh, you know, or I want to build a new football stadium where the, you know, the income is this, the age is this, the, you know, zoning values, the property value is this. And we're talking about things like dollars and percentages. And how can I, can I add up percentages and values? And things like, no, I can't. And so, but I can see how high and low they are relative to a standard deviation. Because we're going to do some math here in a little bit. Because the most common probability distribution is what we call normal distribution. And most of the time, I always like to make my data look like this. It gets normalized like our median age. It looks like this and I get really happy because I can look at symmetric and bell shape and apply something called a Z-score, a Z-score. And that tells me how far it is away from the mean, how far the value is away from the mean. We can do these in Excel. We're gonna do this in Excel after the break. When we look at normal distributions, the assumptions that we can make is that anything within one standard deviation encompasses about two thirds or about 68% of everything. Just like these football teams, most of them are gonna be within six and 10 wins. Probably two thirds of your league is between six and 10 wins. Your other third is gonna be your 14, 15 wins or your one, two, three wins. Within two standard deviations, about 95%. Within three standard deviations, about 99.7%. And so we can look at test scores, all these other things, whether you're looking at environmental data, crime data, all these other things that have numerical analysis attached to it. One of the big kind of gaps in this is the comparison of like categorical data or nominal data analysis. And that's another story for another time here. But we can look at skewness. So we can say it's kind of normal, but it's skewed a little to the right. And so this is what we call right skew versus left skew. So it, it is high in the middle and low on the ends, but it, it kind of runs in this direction here with our standard deviations as well. So we've got another formula here called z-scores. And so when it's a set of data is normally distributed, we can kind of standardize it with a z-score. I love z-scores because it makes us able to compare different data at different scales. So how far or below a data is below the mean. We do this thing for like school rates, you know, graduation rates, what's the average school score, everything else that we can look at. If we give it a z-score, it kind of normalizes everything. You know, we've got a particular zip code. What is the median household income? What is the percent minority? What is the average number of vehicles? Everything that's quantitative in nature are going to be slightly different. So we have things like percentages, number of cars, dollars, the year home was built, how old the home is, how many, you know, bathrooms it has in the house. This is all information collected. They're all in different units. So I can't add up bathrooms plus percentage plus dollars and me getting something useful. I just can't, you know, add up $50,000 plus three bathrooms plus the year my home was built in. And I add those three things up and I, I don't have anything that makes sense to me. But if I add up those Z-scores, oh, that definitely makes sense. Now, this is the, this is the formula. The z-score is positive, the data lies above the mean, negative if it lies below the mean. So now this is my z-score right here, and I'm gonna kind of type it in right here, write it right here. Let's talk about the units attached to these because this is what I really, really like. So my z-score, like we said before, is what I'm saying now is the value minus this thing, which is the average. And this thing, which is the standard deviation. So now I've, I've got another metric right here. I'm not, never going to make you go and hand calculate the standard deviation. Because you should make this in Excel. ArcGIS Pro gives this to you. So this is the standard deviation. 
Let me write this a little bit better here. And I'll kind of point to folks over here. I'm just writing a couple things down here. So our Z score is going to be equal to whatever the value is, because median household income for Guilford County is going to have one Z score versus the median household income for you know, Durham County, which will have another Z score. So this standard deviation is what we call a local statistic. So the mean is a global statistic. Standard deviation is going to be a global statistic. The Z score is going to be a local statistic. Local meaning that each county is going to get its own Z score while the entire set of data gets a standard deviation. And so Z is equal to X minus XR over the standard deviation. Oh, these things are running out on me here. Mm -hmm. We might have to go do a little math. Now, if I put the units in here, what are the units? If I'm working with dollars, the units here are dollars, units here are dollars. And so if I were to calculate these, I have the number minus the dollars divided by dollars. What's dollars divided by a dollar equal to? So what happens to the units? They go goodbye. So there are no units attached to these scores. And that's the powerful thing about it. And so when I work with things like age of home and years, median household income, PM values in parts per 1 million, we get rid of these units and they go goodbye. We're going to do a couple of hand calculations and then we'll kind of look at these in Excel. And I'm already at my break time here, so... Um, but if we had a, an X, and so we had, say, the median household income, the Z score is equal to median household income was 20,000, the average was 15,000, and the standard deviation is 5,000. If we calculate this, everyone should be like nodding their head and saying, and tomorrow already said it, but that's equal to what? One. So that means I'm, I'm going to get some new pens here, but it's one standard deviation above the mean. One standard deviation above the mean. And so that's kind of on the high side. If this was 10,000, what would this number be? So 10,000 minus 15,000, which is negative 5,000, divided by 5,000, which is negative one. And so you get an idea as to what above the mean looks like, below the mean when it comes to these disease scores. Yes? How far above the mean and below the mean they, they are? Because what we're eventually going to do is that for each county or zip code or whatever, we might be looking at quality of life indicators. And there might be eight different quality of life indicators, meaning for social vulnerability indices. Has anyone heard that term, social vulnerability? Especially when it comes to things like hurricanes, wildfires, who, what, what areas are most prone to having vulnerable populations, which are old or poor, older, or poor, or people with less transportation. So I have a column here that says average age. Another column here. It's going to be average number of people who don't have vehicles. So one's going to be a percentage, one's going to be in years. I convert those to Z scores. Now I can add up all the Z scores on these and say, hey, when I average up, add up this social vulnerability, this Z score for this is a 10 versus a negative 10, meaning they were above the average on all of these indices, meaning they had a older population, they didn't have access, they had lower income, all these other Z scores, because I can't add up dollars plus years plus this because they're just, they're in different units. You know, I can add up 2X plus 3Y, what's 2X plus 3Y equal to? You don't wanna answer? What's 2X plus 3Y equal to? 2x plus 3y, you can't do anything with it, okay? Kind of like what's, you know, dollars per year plus, you know, age. So, you know, those, those two are variable. Those are like x's and your y. They, they just don't go together. 
But Tamar asked a really good question is, what can we do with these z-squared? They're unitless, so we can just add up, stack up these z-squared, add them all together. So if something has a cumulative z-score above, you know, above zero, because the baseline here is zero. If this number happened to be 15,000, what's the z-score? Zero. I mean, and it's right at the mean. Now, when we get back here after the break, I may ask a couple tricky questions, meaning, all right, I've got a z-score of one. You go and tell me what the value is, given the, the mean and the standard deviation. Okay. So we'll do that. And so we'll take a 10 minute break. We'll meet back here at 610. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up the violent death data that I have in Canvas. And then the first thing we'll look at is the in-class exercise in your kind of classwork folder there. And then what we're going to look at is just school violence rates by county or school district rate. We're just going to open that up, look at those, talk about the idea of normalization. Then we're going to go do some Excel calculations for mean, median, mode, standard deviation. And then we're going to hand calculate those Z scores. We're really going to do it. And get back. It's exciting. I'm excited. Maybe you're not. But really getting a good understanding because whether we're looking at school violence rates or PM values or whatever, I'll stop talking because we're going to get back. So I'll be back at 610. So those of you kind of online there, I'll be back at 610. And then <clears throat> those of you joining us online, open up the two folders that we have right here. So open up the folders that we have here. Under course materials, I've got something here called North Carolina Violent Death Reporting System. <coughs> and then the in-class exercise there. All right, we got Isaiah. How's it going, Isaiah? Maybe not. Can I ask you a question really quick? Of course. It doesn't have to be really quick, but... <laughs> um, so for the GIS basics course, I took that in field technologies. Do you want me just, to do it again? Or do you want me nope. to just give you that certification? Just upload that cert certification. That's fine. Okay. Okay. You took the field mapping class, right? I did. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. It's, there were so many, there was like 18 people in that class. So it was really hard to remember. Um, what, uh, what year are you now? I'll be done in May, so senior. Okay, cool. Awesome, awesome. I guess you're working during the day and everything too? Um, I work nights, but yeah. Uh, so I work nights for like half half the month. So we do like eight days on, six days off. Oh, wow. Okay, so you're nice and nice and busy. What are you looking <laughs> to do after this? Um, I'm going to get my master's degree. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, okay, you but... I work for a municipality now, so I'm hoping I can just like transition into a GIS role within the department I'm in. Okay, cool. That, yeah, so uh, out in Nashville or? Yeah, so I I work for the water department. I've gotten really lucky. I have a good relationship with our GIS specialist. So okay. Um, we're hoping that it can just be like a transfer of like, I'd still be in the same department, but I just go work with her and, um, do like, she's looking for someone to do hydro testing and flow testing, um, using ArcGIS and. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's like all of our hydrant testing has to be done on a map and it's, we work with all the fire departments in the county and the city working on that. So hopefully that's kind of like soon they're trying to get all of it handled right now with hr and then i'd oh, go wow. i'd go on to days which would be nice <laughs> oh that's exciting yeah we, we have a student um tra uh, transfer student and he does stormwater for downtown durham you know right right down the street here um yeah. you know basically figuring out where the water goes it goes down wherever down is and you know you got to bring in the impervious services and everything else like that were you, did you start here or did you transfer from somewhere else? Transferred. So I started at UNC Charlotte um, okay. and then I transferred 
uh, I just like came home and I was at AB Tech and finished my associate's degree and then transferred in the spring. Did you take any GIS classes over there? At Charlotte. At uh, AB Tech? I'm not. Okay. I thought they had a couple of geomatics classes and things like that. So. Yeah, they do. They have a really good GIS program. Um, my sister's associate's degree is in like CAD and GIS. So oh, cool. she, I, I, her program, she loved it. I mean, so I got really lucky, but I think I didn't even really decide I wanted to do GIS until the spring. I was just like, I can't do environmental policy. I can't do like, yeah. I just can't. So. Oh, cool. All right. Awesome. Um, I'll be back in a couple minutes here and us going here and we'll be starting up at 610 and everyone here both online and in person can see what we've got you know, got going on here.
Okay. All right, I'm getting ready to start up here. Okay, and while I'm talking here, is that I'll post an announcement tomorrow and did everyone, was everyone able to see the movie I posted? It looked like some people viewed it and everything. And I do a good summary of what's due. So we've got GIS basics due next week. And hopefully the first exercise was turned in. Usually this first one, I give a little bit of leeway with due dates, especially folks kind of learning GIS the first time. Folks who should be doing the spatial joins and the queries and all that. I'm kind of looking, well, Ariel, Ariel just like pointed away from me here. People who kind of took this before, um, you know, sh it should kind of get the rust off because, you know, GIS is a skill like, any, you know, like anything. And if you're not used to using it, then revisit it. And to me, I kind of take it for granted. I, I know this stuff like the back of my hand, but I think some of you is kind of relearning it a little bit or learning it the first time is, I think sometimes the learning curve is a little bit steep that I need to be a little more, and I need to be a little more receptive to. But in addition, we have these things called readings, and this one will be due in two weeks, but we got a reading assignment that I've posted, and so you got two weeks to work on it. And what I like to do in geostatistics class is post readings and publications that I've done that you go through, read, interpret, and all that other good stuff and answer some questions about. So all of our graduate students or students taking it as part of graduate credit you need to do all four readings. And then undergraduate students, you only need to do two of them, and then you can do the other two for extra credit. So that's kind of why I was talking to Jordan before, because he went, and I think he did all of them, and so we got, like, lots of extra credit, you know, for the class. You know, so much extra credit that he might have already gotten an A for, like, the grad version of the class, because he gave himself an extra 50 points. And so this is a reading that 
we published in something called Sociation. The, uh, it's called the um, Sociological Journal of, uh, for the Sociology Journal Organization or something like that of, of uh, North Carolina, of uh, Sociological Journal of North Carolina. But my wife, she was a non-traditional student, so she just graduated like two years ago or something like that at the age of however old she is. And uh, I don't want to, hopefully she's not listening, but she's not as old as me. But um, but she went to Guilford College, had to take uh, like um, sociology class. And so her and I worked on a paper on a topic here called Exploring Rural Food Security in North Carolina, Debunking Ur Ur um, Urban Myth. And then Dr. Manick began, led some uh, help, help lead some help on this, but it was talking about the idea of rural food security, because a lot of times when we talk about food security, what do we think of? We think of food deserts in rural, you know, in urban areas, but there's a whole segment of the population out there that we don't really necessarily, necessarily think of, you know, marginalized population also include rural, which have kind of less access to food and other amenities. So when we look at things like cancer rates and malnutrition rates and all those other things, in addition to individual choices in biology, I, I think the built environment plays a, a good a good part in it. And so there's a data set out there uh, from the north uh, from the USDA, and so we just ran some kind of really basic statistical analysis. So you can go and read this. This is over in Gibsonville, North Carolina, but we did some basically some statistical analysis where we looked at census tracts. And tracks are subdivisions of counties because most of the time when you're doing analysis on air quality or water quality or exposure or anything, mental health, or, you know, even mapping mental health or cancer, we don't care. What, I, mean, I, I don't care what it is at the county level. I, I don't. Why? Because county level is extremely coarse and there's a lot of things going on in that county that are going to be kind of, te won't be teased out at the county scale. We can look at zip codes and zip codes where we have death rates. Now there's probably 15 zip codes in this county where we look at things like ESL or mental health and some of the limitations that we're gonna have are the scale at which the data are provided. So if you go to something like the COVID-19 dashboard, the best scale you're getting at that is the zip code. Uh, we look at cancer mortality or any type of mortality collected through the North Carolina um, Department of Vital Statistics. And that's what I worked with the PhD student Alana with. Well, we have a big table sitting on this computer somewhere, like all 1.8 million people who died over the last 20 years, just waiting to be analyzed of what they died of, how old they were, their age and their race, and all these other attributes that collected about them, where she only collected the female breast cancer mortality rates. There's tons of other things out there, maybe related to mental health and suicide or asthma and air quality or anything that you can think of, um, anything that you can think of. And so we teased out this database and you can see census tracts are subdivisions of counties. And so we've got a couple thousand of these, but when we actually look at the percent of people, population living in food, in food insecurity, it's actually a lot higher than urban and suburban. That was kind of like interesting, you know, you know, even though the actual population is less, but percentages is higher. And so I did some statistical analysis because we were just talking about like averages, percentages, and all those other things. So I think this would be a really good lead in. This would be a really good lead in to what we were uh, you know, talking about today. I do something here that I don't ask too many questions about. Where that, hey, let's look at the rural food insecure areas. And rural food insecure is 57 for white, it's 57% versus 74% for rural food secure. What are the percentages that those are the same? Really low. So even when we look at rural food insecurity, it's really skewed to who? African American, multi race, Hispanic. <laughs> that's a you know i think that's coincidence no and so even we see these challenges in urban areas 
Or, you know, we got someone who went to A&T. Were there a lot of supermarkets over near A&T? Uh-uh. Oh. All the way across town to go to Whole Foods. Yeah, you got to go all the way across town and go to Whole Foods, like East Market Street, you know. And over where I lived, I lived on West Market Street for a while. It wasn't that many. They had, like, International Mart and stuff like that, but I'm not going to go buy pigs and, uh, whatever, you know, in the, at the actual International Mart or whatever. So you can see there's definitely some intentionality with these, you know, what are the chances that, you know, we have, you know, picked out 10 people that happen to be, you know, six feet high on campus, pretty low. You know, what about 20 people or 50 people? The chances get much, much lower. But when we look at these things with random chance right here, there's definitely, if these two things were equal to each other or they were random, we wouldn't see these patterns. We might be see 61% versus 59% or 63% versus 57%, but those, uh-uh, uh-uh, definitely not. And so we later run this thing, this is what we call an inferential test, and we'll talk about these later. So I just kind of ask you to interpret these. And then what we're talking about today is I kind of, go through the rural, I go through the suburban, I label these metropolitan, and I basically, I just go through and add everything up. And then we'll just look at a couple of the questions right here if I can. But, but you're gonna take this here, preview, I guess this is the actual quiz, and it's five questions. So it talks about metropolitan county. What is a metropolitan county that can, you know, what is the definition of a metropolitan county? Just like the word rural, what is rural mean? Talk about this last week. What's the? I wrote a paper. We wrote a paper earlier this year. That what is the definition of rural? There's nine different definitions of rural. Actually, believe it or not, which rural definition of rural is best? Because a lot of times when people talk about paper or you see something on the news, it'll say like rural counties have higher rates of food insecurity or higher rates of COVID than other than other counties. And my first question is, like, what definition of rural are they using? We used three, we looked at three different definitions of rural. We used something called the ANOVA. Has anyone heard the term ANOVA before? We will later, you know, meaning it's like a two-tailed T-test, but for multiple sets. Like, hey, if we use this definition of rural, the median household income is 40,000. If we use this definition of rural, the median household income is 50,000. If we use this definition of rural, the median household income is 38,000. They're really different. You know, just based on the definition of rural you're using, you know, irregardless of the data and everything else. So metropolitan county, what's the definition of metropolitan county? Uh, in North Carolina, the highest percentage of people live in regions classified as this. Um, in North Carolina, the region where the highest percentage of people live in food insecurity is what? Well, that's the whole, this is the paper. So you all better get that number three right. And then these last couple right here, um, the region with the highest percentage of people who have low access to healthy food. Low access to healthy food. Um, now this is a little bit different than food insecurity. Okay, food insecurity, satisfies two criteria, meaning they're low income and they're far away where that access to healthy food, it could just be high income, but still far away. Okay, access is purely geographic in nature. What's this class? Geospatial statistics, GIS. And so we can measure this space stuff one mile, okay? If I live one mile, I kind of live in the sticks right now, but I wouldn't call myself food insecure because I don't satisfy the, the income, even though I might be, you know, 10 miles or whatever the definition of it is. So food insecurity does satisfy two strict criteria. And the book and the paper gets into that. So I think it's a relatively, I don't want to use the word easy read, but it's, you know, something to kind of get the gist of here. And then number five, that's kind of like using the two-tailed T-test, which of the following conclusions can we make? Okay, and just make sure you, you read these because unfortunately with statistics, we start to use these fancy words like statistically different because we don't want to make these overarching assumptions because a lot of times I say, you know, the average income in this area is higher than the average income in this area. And it's, it's 59,000 versus 60,000 and it's really not statistically significant. 
meaning you know it's only a thousand dollar difference and those could be due to sampling errors that was your tape measure good enough was your sample size good enough kind of like the example with the elections where someone says all right they're winning 40 percent to 40.1 percent but it's plus or minus this amount so we saw this in the 2016 election who do we think was going to get elected you know clinton but what happened she wasn't elected because that plus or minus was much, much different. You know, she's probably winning 43 to 40% plus or minus 4%, but she got the minus, the other person got the plus, and won. And they also won the right states and all that other stuff. But that's another, that's another thing there. Okay, so what you'll do, and this will be due in two weeks there. So undergrad students, you only have to do two of these. The other two are extra credit. Grad students will do them all. And then if you turn it in late, it'll just earn you know, half credit. So we've got this reading right here. I really like these readings. And I like them these days in the last couple of years because they're all my readings. So it's, it's good to read my stuff. Yes. Is that the one that she put on? Would it get started for the basics? GIS? Yeah, no, it's called GIS basics. Okay. Yep. Is it on? It, it should be. Uh, did I put it up there? Yep. Yes, it's up there because it used to be called getting started with GIS and they changed it to GIS basics. So GIS basics is up there and ready to go. And if I think of it, I'll put a link to that as long as you sign in. And, and then the other thing, we'll talk about exercise two. Um, at the end of class when we get out at 8.30, and then we'll go from there. 7.30. Oh, okay. I do want to get out at 7.30 because I go home and I, I got a 5.30 workout. In the morning, so, yeah. Oh, I like to wake up early. So, all right. So, what we'll look at first is we're going to look at in-class exercise two. So, we're going to click on this thing here, and we're going to download it. It's going to look something like this. I don't want to look at it here because I want to download it and open it up in Excel. And so we can click on it. We can right mouse click. We can save link as or whatever we want, however you, your computer works. But I'm just going to click on it. I'm going to save it in my documents. Or if you have a dedicated folder for this class or on your flash drive, you can do it. So you can actually see my, you know, what I've got going on here. I've got, uh, I really do have it going on. The PC, geography, and then I think I'd call it EASC. Yep, so this is this class right here, and I can save it under, you know, this is my whole folder right here, but I'll just click Save. And now I'm going to open this up in Excel, because this might be some of our first foray into Excel, and I really like Excel as a, a good kind of, as a good data analysis tool. And this is what we'll kind of focus on in this class, even though you, you've probably heard of things like R and SPSS and SAS, but anything that we're going to do in this class can be done using ArcGIS Pro as well as, um, as well as Excel, especially with the statistical analysis. And I'm just going to open this thing up that I opened and download it, date modified. So I've got my in-class exercise number three ready. And here it is. So what we're looking at here are is um, LEA, these stand for local education areas. And then I've got the LEA name, reportable crimes. So if you go to Department of Public DPS, Department of Public Education? No. Department of Education. DPS is or public safety. But if you go to the uh, there are um, North Carolina public school website. You can download these files. A lot of times they're really hard to find, especially files like this, because they don't want you looking at stuff like this. You know, I've got kids at school and they don't want like, hey, this school has a lot of crime and high failure rates. We're, we're going to start avoiding this school. So it's really, you know, to be honest with you, it's really hard to sometimes find these, uh, these particular data files. You know, they'll give you the report cards and everything else. And so what we have here are local education areas. I've got reportable crimes. I've got average daily admission or whatever here. So this is how many students are in this county. And then this is the normalized rate 
of crimes right here. Okay, so it's normalized per 1,000. Okay, it's not per capita, per 1,000. And so in Clay County, for every 1,000 students, there's 8.15 crimes. Why did they turn these things into per 1,000 students? Why would they do it per 1,000? The normalized population. Yeah, they normal. But why don't we just do three divided by three six and go from there and just do 0.000.00815? Why don't we just do that? It's easier to read the data. Exactly. It's easier to read the data because we do per capita. I don't know what 0 0.0085 crimes looks like. I know what 8.5 crimes looks like for every thousand students. I know what a thousand students looks like. It was a little bit smaller than my high school. You know, my high school was about 1,200. So in my high school of 1,200 people, we would get eight of these reportable crimes per year, per school year or whatever. And obviously, with Cumberland County has 249. Well, it has so many because, well, it's got so many and students there. So we can go and sort these as well. <laughs> so these elements that read cross are called records. The elements that read down are called attributes. So we're looking at five attributes. We have an LEA number. In this case, that's going to be treated as nominal data, meaning just because it's 0, 1 versus 0, 2 versus 0, 3 doesn't make it any more special or any other any better. And they can be sorted. We have an LEA name. Some of these are county schools, but you can see like Mecklenburg, Charlotte, or Charlotte, Mecklenburg, Alamance, Burlington County schools. That's just the name of those. And then you can see things like Hickory City, which is in with Catawba County, or around here you've got like Orange, uh, you've got Orange County schools, and then you've got Chapel Hill Carborough schools, which are a separate district. When I grew up, our high school was like its own school district with another high school, so it wasn't part of our county. We paid taxes to that high school. So if you kind of grew up up in Morgan County uh, in townships and towns, it was a little bit different. Edenton showing that county here. So now we can sort these. Does anyone know or does anyone not know how to? Uh, I won't do asking that, but we can sort these by county. So if I wanted to, I can go to data. And to me, this data is really, really neat. So we've got this data tab right here. And now I can sort this from highest to lowest. I can run these things called filters, and these filters are typically going to be run on nominal data. I can go to the top and do, click on sort. I can click on sort because we, yesterday or last week we talked a little bit about how to sort the data from highest to lowest. You did that for number 10, right? Didn't you do that? When you said Wake County was the highest. How'd you know Wake County was the highest? Because you went and sorted. Did anyone go through and say... All right, let me keep going down and look for the highest one. Well, no, you didn't. So you went and sorted. And hopefully the video that I had articulated that as opposed to making you look through it all. But uh, Excel is extremely powerful in terms of uh, what do I want to sort? Okay, I want to sort by what? Portable crime rate. Smallest to largest, largest to smallest. And I got a little clicky thing up here that says my data has headers. What does that mean? That very first row, those aren't going to be calculated. Oh, that's what you were going to say. To I just answered my own question. I do, you know I do that a lot. And so that little row up there that says my data has headers means that that first row, weren't, those aren't going to be part of the calculations because those are our attribute names. Now, in our ArcGIS Pro, that's good. those are going to be you know independent. That POP 2013 isn't part of a row here where that Excel doesn't know that. So I can do largest to smallest, click OK, and then what did I just do? So I changed it from alphabetical order that it currently was in to reportable crimes, ADVM. And now what county has the highest reportable crime rate? It's Transylvania County, it's 33.04 all the way down to some other count. We've got some zeros here. Jones County, Elkin City, Tyrell County. These are largely small. And those of you who have kids in school, they do they try really hard to kind of hide those things and not report them out because they don't want to look bad or whatever or you know make the school look bad here. And so we can do this. Now, 
One of the other things that you can do here is that I can go and highlight a particular row right here. If I wanted to highlight a row, typically in the bottom right here, it'll say, I've got a count of 115, I've got an average of 3750, I've got a min, I've got a max, and I've got a sum right here. So every once in a while, you can set up or you can right mouse click here and you can say, what do you want to see right here? Customize this bar right here, what do you want to see? So you can see I right mouse click and I said, I want to look at the average, count, min, max, sum, shortcuts, anything else. So if you want to really cater your you really want to cater your Excel, you can do this right here. Okay, I'm not as familiar with kind of this version of Excel as the previous versions of Excel that I was in love with, but I love this data stuff right here because we're going to look at filters here in a little bit because we're going to look at the North Carolina violent reporting data set here that has like 400,000 records here that gets really ugly really quickly. Now, what I want to do here, here, what I want to do down here is I'm kind of looking at this here. And what I want to do for the reportable crime rate here is I want to do the mean, median, variance, standard deviation, and weighted mean. We're going to do the first four of these here. Now, for this crime rate right here, what I want to do is for all 115 columns, I want to add them all up and divide by 115. And there's 115 because we have 100 counties in North Carolina but there's some other counties out there or other cities that have their own school district like Elkin County versus the rest of Surrey County or whatever county Elkin's located in that are independent or Lexington versus Davidson County. And so we have a few more school districts than counties. Now, what I wanna do is just go through and add all these up and divide. Now, we're not gonna do this by hand. And so one of the things that we can do here is we've got little calculations. And so those of you who are familiar with Excel, this might be a refresher. Those of you who are doing this for the first time, yeah, you're going to learn new things here. So the first thing we ask for is the mean, right? So I'm going to type in the word mean right here because I'm going to go and just calculate a number of these descriptive data sets right here. So I typed in the word mean right here. And right next to it, underneath the word mean, I'm going to calculate the mean here. And you can see the mean here. And now up in the top right here, I can start typing stuff in. There it hi highlights. But the second I type in the top here an equal to sign, that means that's a formula. That's a formula. So I've got a formula right there. Now I can type in a formula. Now what's the another name for the mean? Average. So I'm just going to start typing an A, B, oh, look what I got right here. E, R, what do you see up there? I can click on the word average. And it gives me a little parentheses. This is really scratching the brain, but what does that parentheses mean? Do you remember that? What does that parentheses mean from math class? Do you remember like F at X equals 2X plus 3? What's that little parentheses mean? Starts with a P. Stands for parameter. Does anyone remember what that is? F at X equals 2X plus 3, and you plug in the whatever, the X, F at 2 equals this, F at 3 equals this. So it's an input parameter. And so I click on it, and it says average, and it says number 1, number 2, comma, dot, dot, dot. What's dot, dot, dot mean? You click as many numbers as you want. I know this is really beginner for a lot of people here. Um, so I want to really get some folk catching up who've never done this before. So what numbers do I want to click on? What do I want to find the average of? I just want to find the average of everything from 0, 0.00 all the way to the top. So what am I going to do is while it's open here, it's going to move over and I'm going to highlight every single one of these cells that I want averaged. So it says E2 colon E116. What does this E2 stuff mean? E2. What does it mean? That's where it is. And so it's got a little grid up here. It's column E, row 2, all the way down to column E, row 122. That's all it is. 
or column 116. I'm sorry. And now when I'm done, I just hit enter. What did I get? 12.32. Okay. Next one is the median. What do you think you're going to do? Equals? Think there's something there for median? Well, let's figure out. M E D. Oh, there it is. I A N. Do I want to find the median of? The same exact thing. Get for meeting 11.61. So, what does that tell you about the data? If the median is slower than the average, what's that tell you? Or higher than low, exactly on the right chat, correct? So, so we got some more highers than lows. So if we were to look at these, we probably have a couple more higher values here. And when you think about it, the highest value is almost three times higher than the mean. So you got some of those 33s, 34, or 33s, 32s, kind of putting it up that way than the mean. Next one we've got. I ask for, what's, the, what's this one I'm asking for? Variance and standard deviation. Oh, yuck. Okay. So we're going to type in the word variance equals, let me just start typing in, V-A-R. So oh, which one are we going to click? Calculates the variance. Hmm. Does it matter which variance that we click on? I was going to say no, because <laughs> you're expecting me to say it. Does it matter? Because just looking at it is like ignore, ignores logical values in text. But we've already set up the data so that what? It's already got, we, oh, we're working with their numbers. So I'll just click, I'll click on the first one. And then let's see what it gives me.
42.3. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, I'm not a big variance fan because I typically don't work with variances because we're going to assume this data is normally distributed or maybe not assume, hope these data are normally distributed. What'd you get for variance? 42. And then the next thing we're going to type in is standard deviation equals S T D. We'll probably do the same thing here. What'd you get for standard deviation? Has anyone noticed the relationship between the variance and the standard deviation? What happens if you happen to multiply the standard deviation times itself? What do you think you get? Variation to the variance. What's that called when you multiply something by itself? Square, and then this will be the square root of. And what's this standard deviation mean? Basically, it means that about three quarter, two thirds of the data is going to be between about six and 18, right? Mm -hmm. About six and 18, which is just 11.61 plus 6.5, 11 point, because we're not working with this 15,000 anymore. We're working with real life numbers. And so to me, I like this than this, because this, this variance isn't yeah, young. Last thing we'll look at is we'll look at the weighted mean. Remember that weighted mean with the GP, you know, GPA and all that other good stuff? And so how do we calculate the, the weighted mean here? There's a couple of different ways that we can do it. What I'm going to do is... What we're going to do first is we're going to calculate our quality points. How do you calculate your quality points in your GPA? How do you calculate your quality? You just let you just let Banner Nine figure it out, and that's, that's what it does for you. That's it. You don't figure out what you need to get in this four credit class, so you can keep your GPA above three point I don't see anyone nodding their head. Better. You just do as well as you can. So, but what we do is we calculate quality points times the grade. So what's the quality points? ADM, this is the number of credits, times the grade. Number of credits times the grade. And then we'll just call this thing here, I kind of want to do this thing called quality points, because you're going to see where I'm going to here. Quality points, and so it's the number of credits times the grade. Basically, what's the number of credits mean? The weight. What's the weight of it? The weight. Okay, so that four credit class is weighted four times more times the one credit class. So this times this. Now, I can type in a formula here that says equals this column with the multiply sign in on your computer. A little asterisk times this column. So look what I get there, 37,000. That's your weight. Now, if I want to copy that Copy that formula down. Did everyone get 37,000 here? What if I want to keep doing this? I'm going to move to the corner here and look for this little cross. Literally just drag everything down. Look at that. Drag everything down. 
Just one column. So I just multiply in column D times column E. Okay. Yep. So what are our quality points? Now, finally, you calculated your quality points. How are you going to get your GPA? Can you tell me in words how you're going to get your GPA? How are you going to get your GPA? So you multiplied four credits times four for your A plus one credit times three for you, two for your C. So, because what we did, which is we did the one credit, so what are you going to do? You're going to add them all up and divide by what? Total number of credits. What's the total number of credits here? Total number of students. So now my weighted averages, I'm going to put this little column right here. Equals one more formula. What is it equal to? The I want to add everything up. What's another word for add everything up? Sum. Equals sum of what? All these quality credits that I went through or quality points that I calculated. Divided by the sum of what? Everything in column D. And before I click enter, what do you think a good number is going to look like? If I get a number like 873, do you think that's going to be right? Probably not. Why? We, we already did the mean and the median, so the weighted mean is going to be somewhere around those. Somewhere. Click enter. And I got 13.42. You didn't get that? What'd you get? You got a thousand. Yeah. A thousand something. Okay. Oh, okay. Now. No. Remember your Aunt Sally. Who, who's your Aunt Sally? Please excuse my, we're not dividing by the sum of all these things. We could divide by the sum of one versus two. So, All right, so what we got here is 
13.42. What's that mean? 13.42. It's higher than the mean, the higher than the median. What's that mean? When we ran the average, basically every single county counted the same as the average. Should it really? Should the counties that have 472 counties be averaged the same as the counties that have three, four, five thousand? No. So all this means is that when we look at this higher average, that the high population counties have higher rates than the low population counties. So when we look at the true rate, it's not this. This is the average of all the counties. This will be the average of all the counties, which is understandable and doable here. Now, there's lots of other ways we can do weighted average. I just took this GPA. One thing I could have done is, you notice quality points is 337,000. It's like the reportable crimes, right? So I could do the crimes, do stuff with the crime and the ADM and average those up as opposed to extracting those out. But I create these quality points. So now when I do the average, Lincoln County, Person County, or is this Person County? Oh, Durham County Public Schools, Robeson County, they're going to contribute more to that weighted average than Halifax County, just like your GPA did, all right? Just like your GPA. You know, that four credit class or that six credit class is going to count more than the one credit class. Because when you get your grades, you're going to average up A, B, C. No, no, you're not. You know, that's what we did the first time. So the next thing that we're going to look at here is, all right, we got Z scores, okay? And we'll mention, you know, we'll talk, we'll calculate these. We'll look at another data set real quick with something called filters. And then I'll kind of leave you for your, you know, open up the homework a little bit and, you know, leave you with that. So now, calculate the Z-scores for the following counties. Okay, calculate the Z-scores for Guilford County. Now, we got this formula here for Guilford County. We got this formula here. That Z equals X minus X bar divided by standard deviation. And I'll kind of point this over for our students here. So it's Z X minus X bar divided by standard deviation. And my dad said, when we have equations, one equation, one unknown, you can figure it out, right? Two equations, two unknowns, you can figure it out. So Z is the Z score. Okay. So I want to find the Z score. So when I look at Guilford County, first, what's X bar mean? That's the average. Do we know the average for all the data? 12.32. We'll use 12.32 as opposed to the weighted average. And I'll put a little parenthesis right here. Because I'm talking about that Aunt Sally person. You know what that means. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. What's X mean? The value. What's the value for Guilford County? So if you were to just look up Guilford County somewhere on that row, what's Guilford County? Maybe Sordom or whatever? Guilford County. Yeah, I got Guilford. The rate. 23.67. 14.76. So 14.76. All divided by what's the standard deviation for Gilbert County? So what's the standard deviation for the whole data set? 6.1. Can you do the math on that? Bet you can. Here's the 
6.54 came from the standard deviation. What'd you get? It should be like 0.33 or something like that. 0.37. 0.37. So it's slightly above the mean, right? In this case, is above the mean good or bad? Not too. Is it that much above, above the mean? Not really. You know, but it's still above the, the mean. And then what I ask you to do is calculate them for everything else. Who wants to keep doing hand calculations? Anyone want to keep doing hand calculations? <laughs> no, I don't either. Okay. Do you think we can do a formula here, make a column here called z-score and do a calculation for that? You bet we could. What's the formula? Remember my aunt Sally here. So what's z? Or what's x? I'm going to put a little parentheses right here. And it's going to be what? The value minus, oops, hold on. I'm going to put a little equal to sign. I'm going to put a little parentheses. Value minus what? 0.32. Is the average going to change throughout the data set? Is the average going to change? No, it's a descriptive data set. What's the only thing that's going to change? X. So whatever it is for Halifax County or Durham County or Guilford County or whatever I ask you on the, on the exam in four or five weeks. So I can put in a little formula, E2 minus 12.32, little parentheses there, divided by what? 6.54. Is that 6.54 going to change each county? Because it's descriptive data set. It's what we call a global as opposed to we're calculating these z-scores, which are locals. You said locals. You didn't get in the hang of it. Good. Is this, does this bring a bell or are you just kind of catching on real quick? Oh, good. So now, here we go. We got 3.16 is my z-score. I could just drag this down all the way to zero, which is negative 1.88. So now I've got my z-scores here. Got my z-scores sitting right here. So I don't have any exactly on zero right there, exactly on the mean, but my z-scores range. And so now I can go back things here. I can go and sort these back. And now Alamance has got a z-score of negative 1.26 or negative 0.126. What's that mean? Slightly below the mean. So he sorted it by by this one. A reportable time. A big deal. Sorting by LEA. No big deal. So now what do we see here? Because now if we start to look at what school has the best is the, the best school or whatever. And this might be one of them where that graduation rates are another, reportable crime rates, percentage of kids who go to college, whatever metric that we utilize, I can't add up the rate here compared to other things, but now I can 
Look at the z scores. All right, I got a z score right here. I got a z score. Uh, I got one last question related to this data set, meaning what would the value be if it were 0.75 standard deviations above the mean? All I'm asking for is, all right. Well, let me do sort. And this is where people start to kind of freak out a little bit here. And I want to make sure all I'm asking for is if something were to be exactly right here at 0 0.75, what would the value be? What is it going to be? It's going to be somewhere between 17.09 and 17.34, right? What exactly is it going to be? Can we do a formula to do that? Of course. Now, what's the formula here? We're working with this thing right here. So I'm just going to put it in. Like my dad always said, one equation, one unknown. What's the z-score that I'm asking for? What's the z-score that I'm asking for? 0.75. Equals, what's the average? 4.32. What's the standard deviation? So what am I trying to find? What would the county be? What would the X be if all these other things were true? Can you solve this equation? Everyone should say, yes, I can. It's been a long time, but I can. It's okay. Over a 0.75, so... It better, I better be right. It better be somewhere like 17 or whatever, you know, somewhere in 17. Now, how do I calculate this? How do I, how do I solve for X? Does anyone remember? Cross multiply. Product of means equals product of extremes. So all we're looking at here is 0.75. And 6.54 equals x minus 12.2. That's all we do here. Okay? 6.75. Remember, you do the cross multiply with fractions like 1 half equals 2 fourths. And I bet you 1 times 4 equals 2 times 2 all the time. That's how you figure out two equate or two fractions are equal to each other. Okay. Now, we're not working with one half and two fourths. We're working with x minus x minus 12.32 over 6.54 because all I'm doing is this formula right here. 17.225. And that kind of makes sense, right? I said it better be somewhere in the 17s because we're already looking at numbers here where 0.76 is 17.34. 0.72890 this is 17.09. So it's 17.22. Yeah. And so the value being 17.x is equal to that's what the value would be. That makes sense, right? It's above the mean, you know, above the mean. So, you know, and just be careful with your calculations because. I've seen people do this before where they don't put in the parentheses and all of a sudden we get some ugliness that happens. Uh, we get a z-score 31. If I don't put it in the parentheses, why? The computer's stupid. What is it going to do? It's going to do 31, subtract whatever 12.32 minus 6.54 is equal to. So when we run these Z values, computer's only going to do whatever you tell it. If it does the wrong thing, it's because you told it to do the wrong thing. So what are Z values typically going to be? What's a good Z value? What are they running? Am I going to get 30? If I run this and I get 31 for a Z value, what are you going to say? You did something wrong. It should be somewhere between like negative 3 and positive 3, something like that, somewhere in there. 
And we looked at the percentages, and standard deviations, and all that other good stuff for the normal distribution. So we have those. So we have those right there. And then if it were negative one, we would just plug in negative one, do the same exact thing. Obviously, it's going to be below the mean. So it's going to be around six or so. The other thing, um, did we want to open up exercise two a little bit? Because I'm done with this one here. Do you everyone feel good about that? Okay. Uh, something in there I also posted was database from the North Carolina Department of Health's uh, violent reporting desk. Violent reporting depth system. Um, I'll show you this, but this is a dashboard that has like 400,000 records of violent deaths by county, by age. I think there's some race, uh, race indicators over here, as well as rates. And so we've got tons and tons of different things right here that we can query. Uh, we can look at things called filters as well. So we've got a, a lot of neat just tons of neat data right here that we can kind of filter out. So when we open up like a dashboard database, we're opening up like, this is the base for it, like 400,000 records. Now think about these, it's a lot, a whole lot. And this is from the violent death reporting system. as by age, by race, all, everything. Yeah. So if we want here, let's uh, let's check out the homework. I just want to make sure everyone can open it up because I did have a couple questions about opening it up. And so when we look at exercise number two, we'll have this due next week. It'll be, then we can download it. The main thing, and I'll kind of zoom on back to us here, that when you download it, you see this little folder button. What's that folder button mean? Zip file. You can't open it up in a zip file, so I can click on it. And one of the things you'll notice, when you click on it, it looks a little different in Windows Explorer or whatever your Explorer thing is. Up in the top, you need to click Extract, and then... We need to extract it. Because now when I extract it, it looks a little different. Does anyone see an extract in on this thing here? Why not? Why don't you see an extract? There's no need to be extracted, it's already extracted. So some of these attention to details are different. This thing says extract because you gotta extract it. This thing doesn't because already extracted. So now I can click on this. I got homework too. It's got the little symbol. It opens up my ArcGIS. Okay, so we look at this here. 
Look at this map here. Does this map look familiar to anyone? It looks like the map that you would have completed right at the end of last week. So what we're doing is continuing on. So the one thing that I did do is that when I ran the spatial join, I created a new feature class. And I think Lauren alluded to the fact that this spatial join in version 3.0 versus 2.8 of the software is a little different in that previous versions created an entirely separate feature class, meaning another thing here on the left that I can click on and click off of, where that what you created last week using the new version of the software basically appended NC counties. It made NC counties and just added the join count and the age units and all that other junk to the end of it. So it kind of saved us a feature class. But when, you know, I might have created this in an old version here, but we've got the age units right here from the spatial join. And what I tried to articulate was, this is what we created right here. This is the average age of death by cancer in North Carolina. The one thing that was really interesting was that, why is this county so low, but everyone else around it so high? This is where UPHD students or other students, this is like a textbook definition of health disparities, right? This is health disparities at its I don't want to say best, but at its worst. So why are people dying so early there as opposed to just the areas around it? What does that count? What were you going to say, Barbara? Did you understand? Make sure we want to click on this whole thing. Is it just like this? Just extract all. What what is this? What county is this? Swain County. What's in Swain County? What's the capital of Swain County? Anyone know? Where Cherokee is? What's Cherokee? They got the big casino there. Is it indigenous or Native American tribe there? What about health? impacts on that area as opposed to other areas. It'd be much lower. What are the reasons? Lots of reasons. One is that it's rural, but you can see other rural areas around there are much, it's, it's, it shouldn't look like that. So what are the things that you can do to either change that? Because we don't want the other counties to go down. We want that county to go up. You know, that's what we mean. This is, you know, health disparities at its worst. <coughs> Okay, but nonetheless here, we've got this map right here kind of ready to go, sitting here, so that now we can make some nice graphs and charts and other things uh, taken straight from this. And so, like, the last thing here that we'll talk about here is that I can right mouse click and open my attribute table. Right mouse click, open my attribute table. And so now, once again, we're looking at the NC counties. In here. We've got a join count, we've got an age units and everything else. I think I just kind of exported this stuff out. And a couple of you I met with, I showed you some of my tricks where that like, you don't need to look at the FIPS and all that other stuff. We want to just look at the county, age units, join count. And so we can basically not delete, but we can, um, we can modify the attribute table so you don't have to see everything else. But one of the things here I can do, I can write mouse click and sort ascending, sort descending. So those of you who don't remember this from before, sort ascending, sort descending, hide fields, calculate fields, statistics summarize. To me, I love this statistics. Uh, I love this summarize because that's what we did when we ran this. You know, we, we don't, you know, it's kind of our kind of secret right here, but we call it statistics where we average up. Isn't that what we did that last week? By county, we went and averaged up every single age of death for all 102,000 people who died of cancer during this time period. We did. We just ran. This is just descriptive statistics by county. Now, under NC County spatial join, and I also have NC counties right here, which has the full kind of plethora of census data. 
But under this NC County spatial join, what can I do? I got create chart. I got tons of charts right here that I can look at. So create chart, right mouse click. That's the type of chart that we talked about this week. Histogram. So I've got a histogram right here. What's my histogram look like? What do I want to map? Let me do age units just because I don't want to do the other one. Age units, look what I got right here. A nice, normal distribution. This is interactive, which means that, guess what I can do? I can click on this county right here. It'll highlight the county on the map. So I got a nice little interactive chart. I have something called bins. What do you think a bin is? How many of these little frequency buckets that I have here? So I can change it. What's a good number of bins? You think having like two bins is really good? Not really. How about having 50 bins? Let me see what 50 bins looks like. If it even lets me do it. 50 bins. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the 50 bins either. So let's just kind of go back to 10 right here. But the other thing that I did want to highlight was that it's got mean, median, standard deviation sitting right there. So your mean and your median are sitting right there. What I do want to do is when I go to my map, I want to clear. Now look at this one right here. It looks like my mean and my median are exactly the same. That's pretty interesting. So there's not a lot of things being skewed in different directions. Rows 100, count 100, nulls 0. What's null mean? No data. So they might not have collected the data. I might have skewed something up or whatever. Min 66, max 75, the sum, I don't really care about this, the skewness and kurtosis, I don't particularly care for. And I can even click label bins right here. But I like this. I can right mouse click or I can look at the attribute table and I can click export. I can export this thing as a graphic. Now I can export this thing if I really want to. I thought I could right mouse click and export this, export this thing. But now I can export, export as a graphic, and now what do I have here? FVG, JPEG. Now I've got another graphic right here that I can talk about my data and have something that I can input into PowerPoint. Because what would you rather look at? Would you rather look at this, or would you rather look at a table of average ages that have 100 of them right there? I'm going to look at this. That shows me what the data looks like. Maybe you can, ship, you know, put these right there. I can click on, you know, axes. I can label them. Whatever I want to. I can put guides. Well, let me add a guide right here. Sure, why not? And whatever else I want to do. Lines across, format. Cool, cool. General. Age by temp. And so I can change that. So now we can export it to the font, whatever you want to look at. And I can export this and stick this in there. Now, the one challenge when we when we look at these, what's it going to look like if I use non-normalized data? If I'm kind of just doing deaths by county, it's going to have like really high, and it's going to kind of look like a, a roller coaster right here. Why? Because it's not normalized. So you're probably going to have a lot of counties that are small, a few counties that are big, and it's not going to tell you that much because non-normalized data, it's great and all, it's good, but I like looking at stuff like this. So now I've got my standard deviation, mean, mean, most standard deviation that you can export into a picture or a homework assignment or whatever else you 
you can do to tell some powerful stories about your, your day. So when you're doing hail or disparity or, you know, birth defects or whatever you want, it's just another piece of the puzzle or another piece of the story that you can use to help. That's it for me. So we got the reading due in two weeks. We've got the homework due next week, which basically you're just opening, you're just continuing on what we did last week. All right. And then I also added some of the readings. So like an introduction here. So if you want to look at some good reading material that I like, that's Ian Nazin. It's not the whole book. This one I do chapter by chapter. That just intro to spatial statistics. This one, I kind of don't worry about the formulas. Know how to calculate stuff. Because the exam, I'm going to give you Excel spreadsheets, and then you're going to have to calculate your stuff. So everyone have a great week. And be on the lookout for an announcement tomorrow from me. And those of you online, we'll see you all later. And I'll post the recording if WebEx didn't mess up because WebEx gets a little thick. So let me stop my recording. And we'll see you all later.